now. So Epson has a uh, landing page for this program now. It has been literally the best kept secret in the industry. They really didn't do a very good job at promoting it early on, and now they are. Um, it's for Windows. It's for Mac. And um, I've also just started playing with the version for your iPhone, where you can literally bring an image onto your phone and print to your printer wirelessly and have just about all of the features in Epson print layout available. Um, and I'm not a big print frame or iPhone person. I'm not even a big Wi-Fi, you know, print from Wi-Fi person. But um, it does work really well. I was really surprised. So, um, so this landing page is where you can go. I just typed in Epson print layout. You can download the latest versions of the program for both Mac and, and Windows. And the, um, oh, and the iOS version, the uh, iPhone version only works with the P700 and P900. Um, so this is a really good, you know, overview of what the program does and how easy it is to use. It is more of an advertising page. So I like to get right into the nuts and bolts of um, this stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, going to minimize my web page. Now, um, the program can operate two ways. Um, you can use it as a standalone application. Okay, so I'm just clicked on Epson Print Layout, and instead of opening up your file in Photoshop or Lightroom and accessing the program that way, you can literally just open it. Um, by itself, take a file, drag and drop it in there, and there it is. You don't need to use Photoshop. And uh, some people like to print through Lightroom. I'm going to show you how to do that. Some people want to be able to access it through Photoshop. I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, but uh, I like using it this way because when I create my files, they're done. They're the size I want to print. Everything's finished. Um, I save my my mass, kind of my master files or the files I want to print. And then, or I'm in Lightroom, I export my files out of Lightroom. I don't really print out of Lightroom for a number of different reasons, which I'll talk about later. Uh, but I just open it up, drag and drop it in there. I can open up other files as well and drag and drop them in there. Um, I've got a little hard drive here. Let's see if I can find something real quick. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Huntington Gardens, do I have any, uh, I, uh, oh, here, here's a, nope, that's not going to help me either. Well, let me get back to that. Okay, so, uh, so everything you want to choose is right here in this one column. Uh, these buttons up here, browse. So you have a thumbnail section down here. If you click that, that kind of toggles the uh, thumbnails. Uh, and this one uh, toggles the settings. If you have thumbnails down here and you could drag and drop multiple images in here, you can make this bigger so you can make your thumbnails bigger. Um, then there is a, uh, we don't want any of that. There is a place here where you can zoom in on your image and then you have a navigator here. Okay, so you can zoom in and have that navigator window there, which is pretty cool. Um, you even have the ability to crop an image. <coughs> the crop image window. So right now it says lock image aspect ratio. So this is the aspect ratio. If you take that off, then you can. So if you crop it, it does. It, it uses its its, ver, its its form of interpolation. Yes. So now see it's cropped it. And then we can go, I'm just gonna put it back out because I don't, I'm not a cropper. <laughs> I see full frame, I shoot what I see, I print what I saw. I don't do a lot of cropping. 
but you can do that here. I mean, this is all stuff you could have done in Photoshop first, right? And if you, if you, that's interesting. Not sure why that is not unclicking. Let's do that maybe. Oh, that's interesting. It's not unclicking. So usually if you unclick that button, then you, you know, this, this box here will, you know, you'll be, it doesn't, it wouldn't adhere to the aspect ratio. Oh, okay. Let's go back here and open that back up again. So we're full frame. Okay. So, um, once you have everything here set, you can set up uh, presets, right? So you can save a preset based on everything that's set up here. So if you have a certain paper at a certain size with a certain quality, you have everything set up, you can just go back up here and go to stored settings and save those settings. Uh, when you're here under printer, you can access any of the printers that you have. Uh, when you first start up the program, it will generally access whatever printer you have on your network or is connected to your computer. Uh, so as you can see, I've had a variety of printers set up on my computer at one point. Right now I have a P900 and I have my iPhone set up as a, um, as a additional <laughs> camera over here. So you can see it on the printer where it says under digital lab. Um, <laughs> Uh, now, media type. This is one of the most mysterious choices and also one of the most important choices that uh, you need to make. So, and the reality is a lot of them are just duplicates of other ones. So the, the two that people use mostly are the ultra premium photo paper luster and, uh, and this other one called velvet fine art. And what the media type does is it tells the printer the mechanical instructions of how to squirt the ink on the paper. So um, ultra premium photo paper luster, uh, semi gloss, uh, photo paper premium paper, semi gloss premium paper, photo paper glossy, Barita, all of these, they're really the same media setting. They're called different things. So that when you buy Epson paper, you don't get confused. So they're really all, all of those are, you're using photo black ink and depending on the printer you have, um, it'll tell it, you know, it, like if you use Velvet Fine Art on the P800, you have to use the front fine art tray. So there's gonna be instructions on what tray you can print from, how much ink is squirted on the paper, um, the sizes, all sorts of mechanical instructions for that media setting are in that media setting. So if you're using any glossy and luster paper, the most uh, common media setting that you would use is ultra premium photo paper luster. And you can verify that by, if you go to, uh, you know, when you go to manufacturers websites like Canson or Hanamula, or Moab or Inova, and you download their generic profiles, they're gonna recommend a media setting. And more often than not, it's ultra premium photo paper luster. It could be premium semi-gloss, it could be premium glossy, but most of the time it's ultra premium photo paper luster or just premium luster. Again, those are all kind of the same. So, um, so when we build custom profiles and, you know, as many of you know, I'm, my day job is I work for freestyle photographic and imaging supplies in, in Hollywood, California, and we have a custom profile service uh, where, you know, you would print out color patches uh, on your computer, uh, on your computer, on your printer, on the paper that you want to profile, and then you would bring those or send those patches to us. And then we would scan them in and create a custom profile. And for all glossy and luster papers, we recommend ultra premium photo paper luster. So um, then you've got your paper size, you have US letter, as well as other paper sizes, you have small postcard sizes. You also have uh, these A sizes. Now these A sizes are all 
um, what we call European sizes. Uh, A4 is equivalent to, uh, it's, a, it's, it's Europe and Japan's letter size. Um, it's called A4. It's like eight and a quarter by 11 and a quarter. It's a little skinnier, a little longer. Um, because these printers are used all over the world, they incorporate the, um, you know, the A sizes in Europe. So the common sizes that we use are US letter, obviously for eight and a half by 11. Uh, you have um, 1117, which is a, also a standard US size. Uh, 13 by 19, which is also known as A3 plus, is the only size that's universal all over the world. We in the United States live in a bubble. We have US letter, we have 1117, and think about it, 1117 is two eight and a half by 11s together, right? Eight and a half and eight and a half is 17. So, so eight and a half, two eight and a half by 11s are one 1117. And then we have um, 17 by 22 as our other standard size. And those are two 1117s put together. Uh, and people ask all the time, why did we go from eight by 10, 11 by 14, 16 by 20, and 20 by 24 to these other sizes. And the answer is, believe it or not, none of this stuff was built for you and I. It was designed for the printing industry. And everything in the printing industry is built around uh, letter size, uh, eight and a half by 11. So you have 17 by 22 sheets, you cut those in half, you have two 11 17s, you cut it in quarters, four, eight and a half by 11s. It's an economical cutting pattern. Um, and then people will say, well, what about 13 by 19? Where does that come from? Well, it's a double truck full bleed magazine size. Again, standard for the printing industry and also the only size that is universal all over the world. So um, Canson Infinity, for instance, is now specifically calling out their 13 by 19 paper size A3 plus because when these sizes get to Europe, they they get confused. They don't see them. So, um, so you have a variety of these other sizes here, but the ones are important are eight and a half by U.S. letter for eight and a half by 11, 1117, 1722, 1319, and then your postcard sizes. Uh, so, oh, also, so Velvet Fine Art, uh, one of the advantages of the new P700 and P900 printer is that you can now feed paper uh, both with a printed with photo black, which would be the luster, glossy, semi gloss, and with the matte black uh, on fine art paper uh, using the velvet fine art paper media setting in the top tray or what they call the rear tray. Um, it's not the one all the way in the back, it's the one on top. They call it the rear tray. And in the P800, and the P600, the previous generation, you had to feed paper from the fine art, um, front fine art tray. Now these new printers still do have a front fine art tray, but you have a choice of whether you wanna use it or not, rather than being forced to. The older printers, you were forced to use it. And that was a little bit of a pain. So What's now- difference? What difference does it make that you have to, that in the older printers where you have to have two different trays to feed? So the thinking by Epson, and sometimes the manufacturers make some decisions for you. Um, the, the top of the printer, when you're feeding paper in there, one of the biggest complaints that people have is over time, the, 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 there's a little rubber foot that comes up and it starts getting saturated with dust and it, um, and it starts to get slick and it doesn't feed paper very well. So what ends up happening is people kind of, you push the print button, you kind of wait for a noise, you wait for the right time. And then you kind of grab the paper and you kind of shove it in there a little bit and help it. Well, the thing is, is paper is really dusty and the paper feeding mechanism in that printer wasn't really designed to feed really thick matte paper. So they forced you to use the velvet, you know, forced you to use the front fine art tray uh, when using velvet fine art 
media, uh, Velvet Fine Art Paper media setting. Now, some people would fake the printer out by using uh, this ultra premium presentation matte setting, right? Now, that uses matte black ink, but it doesn't squirt as much ink on the paper. So it's really designed for a cheap, thin Epson matte paper. It still is a matte black, but you're not getting as much ink as you really should. So if you're using any of the heavier weight fine art papers, you know, just as an example, Canson Infinity, Rag Photographique, um, Hunter Milley Photo Rag 308, Museum Etching, you know, any of those really beautiful fine art papers, Velvet Fine Art Media Setting is the proper media setting. And in your printer, you know, you've got to use that front fine art tray. And it's kind of a pain. The new one is easier to use and better. That one, you know, it was, you know, so a lot of people that had Epson printers just said, you know what, I'm just using like, you know, a, a, a photo black paper. Um, and, you know, Epson's most popular paper is ultra premium photo paper luster. Um, it's relatively inexpensive. It yields a beautiful photographic realistic image. It is never going to um, result in an image or yield an image that's as nice as a fine art paper. Um, somebody earlier was asking about, uh, there's a service we, we, we've been performing for many, many, many years. I've, I can't tell you how many hundreds of photographers um, I've worked with. It's called a inkjet paper psychotherapy session. Right. Um, and uh, most people laugh when I say that, but really it's... Uh, it's a great process where um, you order it on our website. Uh, we charge $99 for it. Uh, when you order it, you would, um, I would contact you uh, and we'd set up a, a one hour consultation where uh, we're gonna talk about, you know, what papers you think you like and don't like. Uh, and I say that because you don't really know until you've seen a great print printed on a variety of different papers and you get to decide what's right for you. So people ask me all the time, what paper should I use? Well, you know what? I could tell everybody to use Canson Platine. That's a beautiful paper. It's a crowd pleaser. It checks off every box of what you would want in a museum quality, you know, 100% cotton gallery exhibition type of product. But that would be a boring world. There's a lot of other choices. So within the con context of our inkjet paper psychotherapy sessions, contact you, we arrange for a one hour uh, initial talk, uh, talk about your history, what your goal is, what you think you like, don't like, send me a file, maybe even two, put two up on one page, and I will print though that image or those images on up to eight different papers. And we can decide what those are when we chat. Um, um, or some people say, just pick eight papers and send them to me because I don't really know what I want anyway. Um, and then we have a follow up our conversation. Once you get them, we send them to you in the mail and then you get to touch and feel them and see them. And, um, and we get to help you decide what's right for you. And once, you know, we get over our you know, our, our pandemic and we, we uh, you know, I've been doing these remotely for people all over the world during the past year. I usually would do them in-house, you know, at the uh, store, um, uh, but we haven't been doing that because we've been social distancing and don't want people, you know, don't want to be around people for three hours at a time. Um, but we do them remotely for people all over the world. And then as we start opening up more, we'll start doing them again at the store if you're local. So, but in any event, um, so in your printer, uh, the P800, you can print in the top using ultra premium presentation mat, but it will force you to go to the front fine art if you use velvet fine art. And here you can see that um, paper source sheet. Um, you can, you know, which is the, the, the rear or the top feed tray, you can feed uh, the paper either way with either media setting in the top. Um, now the, uh, your printer, the P900, um, 
It has uh, adapters that you could put on for roll paper feeding. So there is some roll uh, choices here uh, because the front is a bit flat. If you have paper that's mounted on like a poster board, you can feed it. Uh, it would go through the front fine art tray. And then there is, uh, even on the new printers, there have been some reported issues with really thick papers going in the top. So there is, um, in, in the older printers, we had something called a platen gap. It was very, I don't know why people like that word, platen gap. Everybody loves to say platen gap. Um, now they just call it thick. So there's a button for thick paper. <laughs> so that's kind of raising the print head, but uh, it's kind of still recommended if you're having problems feeding in the top um, to continue to use the front fine art tray for thick paper. That's what it's there for. Um, also, um, what I tell people is that fine art papers are living, breathing creatures. They will absorb uh, moisture over time and they can vary in thickness. And uh, that's why we have these various methods of feeding paper and the ability to adjust the head height and all of those types of things so that uh, if things change based on your environment, uh, you'll be able to be, you know, make a successful print. One of the other very common problems that people contact me about is when uh, what we call a head strike, when you get the little black marks in the corners of the paper or the edges of the paper, and people think they've got to get their printer service. Everybody wants to blame the printer. I don't know why, but it's kind of the first thing people go to. They blame their printer first. Uh, the reality is that it's a combination of events that occur that are environment, paper, and printer. So uh, those marks are caused when you've got the edge of the paper, it's coming through, and the edges are curled up. And they're curled up because it's absorbed moisture. It could even happen in very dry conditions. The paper kind of, you know, it doesn't stay flat. So the printhead comes across and it hits the edge or the corner of the paper and you can hear it, it'll go snap, snap. So the fix is to very carefully curl the edges of the paper down. Or um, if you have a, 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 a table with kind of a curved edge, I might take a pair of cotton gloves and just curl the paper down, you know, on the edge of the table to curl it down. There's also a device that we sell called a DNK Expression D-Roller. They're not cheap. They're they're about twenty. They're about two hundred and fifty dollars, uh, but uh, and they're designed for taking the curl out of paper when printed on a roll. But uh, one of the ways that I use it are um, when I see a piece of paper that does have a sheet that has a curl in it, I'll put it in upside down, and put a reverse curl in it. So instead of the paper going in like this it comes down, it, it curls down, and I never get a head strike anymore. So while it, you know, it is happening because the paper is going through the printer, it's not necessarily a printer's fault. Okay, so, so you can choose your various um, methods of feeding paper here. Uh, then you have a quality setting. So you've got a bunch of them here. You have standard quality, high quality, max quality, max quality carbon black. Now, these are all for the newer printer on the P800. You didn't have carbon black. This is a new feature. Um, and honestly, I'm not excited about that feature. Um, what it's designed to do is if you have a very high gloss paper, not a luster paper, not a matte paper, a very high gloss paper, it kind of puts a second layer of gray ink down and makes the black really super black and really super shiny. Um, I've got to tell you, I've done a lot of testing on this new printer and anything be beyond high quality is kind of a waste to me. Um, I've timed it, you know, I've looked at images really critically. High quality is about as far as I really feel anybody needs to go. Um, standard quality and, and quality, they're close. And you start making prints, putting them all out, you go, eh, I can't really see a difference. You start seeing differences when you're printing really fine text, you know, high quality text. But um, 
uh, high quality is about as far as I think anybody really needs to go to make a very high quality print. Now, uh, these this variety of quality settings is only on the glossy and luster settings. When you go to velvet fine art paper, now you just have standard and max quality. And here I just go max quality. So you have much, you have less choices on your quality setting on a matte paper. Okay, so then also you see you have black enhanced overcoat. That is the same as the carbon black. When you go to max quality, right? You go to quality. I uh, go to high quality, go to standard. So you have this enhanced, uh, black enhanced overcoat. That's the same as the carbon black. And um, my vote is to never hit that button. And again, um, you will only ever see it on a very high gloss paper. And I don't really know anybody who prints on a very high gloss paper. Um, gloss smoothing, this is kind of for a different industry. It does things with the edges of the color and stuff. And in my, uh, I've printed some things and I haven't really seen a big difference in it. I've asked Epson and they're like, eh, it's not really for photography as much what we do. So um, uh, it's grayed out when it's on high quality and I just leave it grayed out. I, I just leave it alone. I'm not really concerned about gloss smoothing that much or this black enhanced overcoat at this point. But then again, once you get the printer and you start playing with it, if you, you know, I always tell people, if you see a difference, you know, it's all about what you like, you know, push that button and make a print, see if you see a difference and like it or not. Okay, layout settings. You've got standard panoramic gallery wrap and template. Of course, most of the time you're gonna use standard. Panoramic is when you're printing on a roll, it'll automatically increase the size of the image to the width of the roll. Uh, gallery wrap is for creating images for canvas. So you can see there's a bit of a line around these. You can set um, your image size and you could do, um, you know, edit, you know, your custom canvas size. So as you can see, I'm on eight by 10, which is this image size in here. And then it is mirroring the image. You can also change it into a color. And let's say I wanted to do this. So your edges of your gallery wrap are now a color or you can mirror it or you can wrap the image around, that kind of thing. So they give you a really nice gallery wrap feature. And then template allows you to uh, put multiple images on a page. So um, one of the things that Canon Professional Print and Layout does is allows you to on the fly load in Im multiple images. Here you've kind of got to set up a template. They've got some standard templates and then you can create you can edit the template and create your own if you'd like to but i think most people are going to do um, a standard layout type which is a single image on a page uh, then you've got your ever uh, present portrait and landscape which i really i've always not liked those two words i always liked horizontal and vertical better than portrait and landscape but so what we got. Um, so if you're gonna do, you can also do borderless printing. Um, uh, so if you go up here, you've gotta do borderless sheet auto expand and then click expansion. And um, <coughs> in order to get, oh, and scale to fit. So you've gotta click all of those in order to get a true borderless print. Um, again, personally, I'm not a big fan of borderless printing. Um, it's kind of reminiscent of the old mini lab days when we took our film to get a process and we get prints back and very rarely did they have borders on them. Um, I like to have something white around my prints. Also, when you're doing borderless printing, it slows down the printer, it uses more ink. You, as you can see, you're losing a certain amount of your image area because it's got to overprint. And then all of these printers now have a maintenance tank and the ink that sprays over the paper goes into that maintenance tank and it fills the maintenance tank faster. So not a big fan of borderless printing. 
But if you want to print that way, I would, um, I would not discourage you from doing so because it's all about you. Okay. Um, so uh, then you can center an image. You could do none and we can move this wherever we want. Uh, I'm going to make it smaller, right? So I can move it anywhere I want. Um, you can also center it. And now if I'm going to make my changes here, if I want to increase or decrease the size, um, it'll stay centered down here in the lower left. You'll see that there's a paper size and then the resolution at the print size it says 323 PPI best. If um, you get too big, uh, this best will go to too low quality, right? So it's now kind of giving you um, like if you're at 280, you're still okay, right? In terms of resolution, I'm going to make this into a 17 by 22 piece of paper. And now the image has increased in, in physical size, but because it's increased in physical size, um, you have a lower pixel density. So now it says that your resolution of print size is 138 PPI mm -hmm. and it is PPI. It's pixels per inch because it's on a computer screen a lot of times even the manufacturers will um, misstate what that resolution is they'll call it dpi your print is a dpi it's dots per inch it's a dot this is a pixel and a dot is smaller than a pixel by far so now you're at 138 ppi because i've taken a you know, a, a, an eight by 10 image and, and put it onto a 17 by 22. And now it's saying the image quality is low. And that helps answer the question that many people come to me with, which is how big can I make my image before it starts looking bad? And my answer always is as big as you can make it until it starts looking bad. <laughs> so I mean, if you're looking at a 17 by 22 image from 20 feet away, you know, the image could look pretty bad and still look pretty good from that distance, right? It depends on where, how close people are going to be to it and such. So 138 PPI is low. Um, generally, I've always said that uh, to get the best out of an Epson printer, uh, your PPI resolution should be 360, generally 300 on a Canon printer. In talking to lots of industry experts, uh, which I have access to, and doing my own testing, those rules aren't as stead steadfast as they have been in the past. Um, having an increased pixel density, like if I'm going all the way down here, and I'm at 400 or 556, not that big of a deal, um, you know. Uh, but as I get up to Let's see, what does it say? It looks like at about two, where does it say? It goes to good at two, uh, 240. It goes to good, right? And then as I get to 180, it gets to low. So this is a pretty good indicator as to what, you know, whether or not your image is going to look good or not. But you, you trust the interpolation enough where, where as long as it's within the, uh, the range of reasonable PPI for an image, the interpolation in this app will just, it'll, it'll do just fine? Yes. And most of, the, most of these layout programs now are really good. They're much better than the ones that they, you know, they used to be. Now, that doesn't mean if I'm taking a small image and want to quadruple it in size, I'm not going to use a program like Topaz AI Gigapixel or something, right? I mean, uh, it, it all depends. I mean, the bottom line is you make a print, you go, that looks good, or it doesn't look good. Um, I've been doing a lot of testing on this. Um, I've done a lot of testing in the past few years on, um, for instance, I took an image uh, that was an image with text, um, took a very small piece of it. I increased it using just Photoshop. Um, uh, and Preserve Details 2.0, which is kind of the most common way that people increase their image size uh, these days uh, because it's free. It's built into Photoshop. 
um, and it does a it does a good job. It does a good job. Then I've used on one's uh, resize, which is the based on the old genuine fractals uh, method of of uh, interpolation. Uh, and I've never really been overly excited about that. And it it does a similar job. I know some people swear by it. Um, I wasn't, you know, in the context of the test I've done, not that excited about it. Uh, then there's another program called Alien Skin Blowup that's really popular. And uh, that did a, a pretty much an equivalent job. Again, wasn't excited about it. But then I used Topaz AI Gigapixel and I've continued to use it and I've been impressed with it every time I've used it. And I'm not saying it's like 100% better. We're eking out like another 10 or 15 or 20% out of the file in terms of sharpness. I can tell you if a file is really bad, it's gonna make it look worse. Um, if it's really good, it could make it look better. Well, then you're um, not, you have the new, you have the new uh, that new function in Photoshop. Uh, yep, there's a new function in it. Well, it's in a camera raw okay. and, uh, and I haven't played with that yet. So, um, but uh, that's an, ex I mean, look, uh, technology continues to move forward. Uh, we all continue to learn more. And I always, I'm one of, I'm, I'm not one of those people that basically says, look, I'm what I'm, you know, everything that I tell you is, you know, the gospel, right? Everybody's got to test things as people, as I, as I teach, as I do these workshops all over the country, uh, people provide me with their thing, you know, their, their tips and tricks that work. And as I do testing and try things, um, I will incorporate new information into, uh, you know, into every one of my presentations. Our knowledge is constantly changing. And again, one of the things that I'm always battling against is people that are watching videos that are 10 years old. And, you know, and then people are present and they don't look at the date on the video. So the program, totally changed in the last 10 years and they're telling me well such and such expert told me this and i'm like well the video is 10 years old you know and our knowledge has changed so so i haven't played with the new camera raw feature yet but um that's very exciting as well so but these programs do a pretty good job they're not necessarily the best but i like the fact that it is giving you kind of an indication down there in the lower left of, of, you know, kind of a good, you know, a good, you know, a best good and, and low quality. So um, it gives you kind of an indication, which I think is very helpful and it's never been there before. So let's see, uh, image size. Um, so uh, you can either uh, adjust the image size by adjusting the margins, the distance of the image to the edges or the actual size itself. And you can use the sliders or you can actually just punch in a number. So this image is 6.65 by 10 inches now. Um, you could do different colors in the margin if you want. I'm not sure again, why anybody would wanna do that. That would obviously use a lot of black ink, but you can see that the, you know, I have a couple of customers that kind of like to do this because the image on a white background does in fact have a different presentation than it does on a black background. I mean, oh, images on a black background are gonna look a little juicier. So um, if you don't man mind using up a, a bunch of ink or uh, you can make this uh, any color in the palette here. You have choices now. If, hmm? you have, if you have a black border now, it gives you some interesting choices in your matting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's kind of an interesting feature. So uh, let's see, I can pick a color that's kind of like the, like the leaves there. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, and then, you know, you've got, uh, you know, lock image aspect ratio so that when you do resize it, it stays. If you unlock it, then you can start doing some things like that, kind of a little cropping type of thing. Uh, and I'm gonna make this 10 inches again. Okay, we're coming, kind of coming towards the end of the line here in terms of this column. And it, as you can see, it is a simplified version of the, um, oh, does it look like, 
Did I freeze? I froze up a little bit, didn't I? Uh oh. Okay, there I am. I'm back. Okay. So, um, okay. So um, we're coming towards the end here. And um, uh, now we're at the color settings. And this is, uh, in addition to the media setting, this is really super important. And one of the things that a lot of people um, completely overlook. So um, when we're printing, my choice on most printing is use ICC profile. Now use ICC profile is exactly the same as what you have previously seen in your driver as Photoshop manages color. The reality is that Photoshop never managed the color. It was a, it, that whole statement has been wrong for a long time. What it meant was that you were going to use a specific ICC profile. Now ICC means International Color Consortium. That is the organization that defines and manages color and is the standard for color in our industry. Um, and so all of the profiles out there, whether they're for monitors or for um, uh, printers, at the end, the file format um, or the suffix is called uh, .icc, like, J, like JPEG or TIFF. These are all file formats or in the raw world, DNGs or CR, you know, uh, ARWs and all those types of things. So they're, those are file formats. So you're going to use a profile. Now, the neat thing is uh, in, uh, on this new program, uh, Epson has created media files where the profile has been associated with it. So you can see up here, I've chosen ultra premium photo paper luster. It has now loaded automatically when I choose auto select the profile for ultra premium photo paper luster. Now, that's always been true when you chose this other, um, this other selection, printer manages color. Again, another mislabeled title to a feature. The printer never managed the color. All it did was it pulled the generic profile for that Epson paper and applied it. So if you're printing on a different paper, like Canton Platine or 100 milli photo rag Barita or any, any other paper, you would be printing on that paper with the generic Epson profile for that media setting, which is incorrect. You would get a print that would look okay, most likely, or maybe not, right? I mean, the generic profiles are generic. They're not for your printer. Um, custom profiles are always better, but, um, my choice is always use ICC profile. I never use printer manages color because um, it's not what it's doing. And you're gonna be, unless you're using ultra premium photo paper luster, it's the wrong profile. And then we obviously, you know, freestyle, uh, sorry, Epson has always had this advanced black and white photo choice. Now advanced black and white photo is their easy button for black and white printing. So right now you can see it's on sepia. I can choose neutral. I could choose cool. And then if you really want to start noodling it out, you could start moving around all of these sliders and stuff. Uh, personally, I have never been a big fan of printing uh, with the advanced black and white uh, mode. I have always been a bigger fan of converting my image in black and white. Uh, in Photoshop, or I use Nick uh, Silver Effects Pro a lot. Um, I make my adjustments, I save my file, and I print using a profile. That's where I'm going to get my maximum fidelity, even in a black and white photo. So I never, you know, I know that there's a uh, people that will try to print grayscale. Don't print grayscale. Don't uh, if you're scanning black and white negatives. Uh, don't leave them grayscale, convert them to RGB. My standard color space for printing on these printers is Adobe, using Adobe RGB 1998 as my color space because the inks in these printers 
are all designed to line up and optimize for Adobe RGB 1998. Um, now, uh, we do have some uh, uh, a menu here where we can uh, choose a specific profile. And as you can see, it's kind of listing every profile in my profiles folder. I have, here's monitor profiles. I've got profiles for, the, these are actually color spaces. They're not profiles for Adobe RGB 1998. They're color spaces. Um, and uh, obviously I have a lot of different printers. So I have a lot of different manufacturers. Uh, generic profiles. Um, I'm really not showing off um, how many profiles I have. I have many more than you're probably ever going to have because I not only have generic profiles from all the manufacturers for all the printers I've loaded, but I also have all these EJs. These are all custom profiles mm. so uh, that we've created for various printers when I'm doing demonstrations and such. So let's say I was going to print on Canton Platine. And yes, I've got a number of different ones because I've been playing with the various quality settings, right? And, and then being able to analyze their color gamut. And there isn't, I found out there isn't a lot of difference between them. So let's say I pick Canson Platine on the P900, ultra premium, uh, photo paper luster, high quality, right? Or I've even tried the Platine they have a specific media setting called platine. Haven't seen very much difference, if, if any, in all of these. So I'm gonna choose ultra premium presentation, uh, sorry, ultra premium photo paper luster. I've got ultra premium photo paper luster here. So I have now chosen a specific profile for that media setting. Now, do you have to install each of the ICCs uh, manually or are they, are they preloaded? Because I used a number of different papers. And... Um, the only ones that come loaded onto your system are the ones that come with the driver for your printer. Hmm. So if you're going to, you know, choose, a, I mean, you're, they're not going to come preloaded for, a, for another brand of paper. Only... <laughs> Epson can load the ones for their for their papers. Okay. So, you know, you would, uh, you know, decide what paper you're going to use. Uh, you're going to go to manufacturers website. Um, all the manufacturers have an area of their website where you can download a profile. They'll generally all have instructions mm -hmm. on how well, I have to ICCs that I use I, that I use in Lightroom currently. Um, okay. So, and so if they're in, in that folder that I store them in, can I, do I link to that folder or do I have to reinstall them for this program separately? Oh, I understand your question now. If they're in your profiles folder, you don't have to install them. It's not program specific. The, pro, the profiles go into um, your profiles folder um, on your Apple computer. You have a, a Mac or a PC? A PC. So on a PC, all you really do it has you download it. You do a right click and you do and you make a choice called install profile, and it'll put it where it needs to go. Okay. Um, but but uh, from but from this program, it'll it'll automatically link to that. Correct. Folder. Okay, that's yeah, all. You I don't have to do anything. It, okay. it it reads it from the profiles folder. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to install them in here. But there is a really cool feature. I'm going to show it to you right now. So under media type, uh, you've got all of these standard ones, right? For uh, that have been loaded uh, from the Epson driver. But as you can see, I've created a custom one called Canson Platine, right? So I actually created that. And then when I put it on auto, da -da, it automatically loads Canson Platine. So this is how you do it. You go here, you go to S F uh, edit custom media, you do an add, and let's say I want to do one for Moab, Moab Juniper Barita. Now you can choose your media setting and you can choose uh, ultra premium photo paper luster. And now I can go down here and choose, uh, give me a second here. I got a good number to go through. Uh, Juniper Barita P900, right? 
and I click OK. And now I have a new one called Juniper Barita. So mm. instead of having to remember what media setting goes with what paper, we can now set it up so that you just choose the paper that you want. And as you can see now down here, it has automatically loaded the profile associated with that media setting. And that's a really, I think a really important new feature because I've been teaching my fine art of digital printmaking class now. I know Jason's still there. I've, I've, I think I've been teaching it there for like eight years. And one of the big things is we use a lot of different papers. We use a lot of different papers in that class. And as you can see, when you know we create profiles, we put you know, at least an indication of what the media setting is. And I could say, can't sell platine, use pro platinum to the cows come home and nobody can remember it, right? <laughs> on a Canon printer. So, so now we can do this. Uh, there is a feature in the Canon side as well that does this. It's a lot more complicated to create, but we're doing it, Jason. We're gonna create custom media settings so people don't have to remember to load the profile. So you just leave it on auto and it automatically loads the profile. Well, you it's have to all about set it up. It's hmm? all about them. We're here for them. We're educators. We're here for them. You know, it's whatever's going to make their lives easier. That's what right. We're, so we're going to do doing. that. Yeah. So, um, so I think this is a great new new feature that takes the guesswork out of you know what media setting that I use do I use for the paper, um, and then Eric? you've got your oh. Eric. Yes. Where I get lost is. You go to the website, for example, Moab, and you download their ICC. And how do you get into Epson? That long list you have. You don't. You don't. You don't get into Epson. So, are you on a Mac or a PC? Mac. Okay. So, on a Mac, you have several profiles folders. Um, the manufacturers will generally give you instructions. Yes, kind of have to read. You know, they they give you a PDF file. It says you know, open up this folder. Um, uh, if you have questions, I really do encourage people to call me or contact me or email me. Um, uh, Jason, do we, did you, do you send out a thing with my email address or anything? You want me to put that in the chat? Yeah, let's put it in the chat. That way everybody has a- 800, Eric. Yeah, I mean, it should, that's what it should be. Okay, so ET Joseph at, I'll give you my official, That's my official email address, etjosephfreestylephoto.biz. So the, uh, you can't, there is no automatic way of loading a profile onto your Mac, but what it is is this. You double click on your hard drive, your Macintosh HD or whatever you've called it. Then you double click on your library folder, okay? And then in the library folder is another folder called Color Sync. Double click on that. And then in that folder is a profiles folder. Double click on that. You just drag and drop the file, the uh, profile into that, not the zip file. Generally, when the manufacturers provide you with a profile, they give you a zip file. Make sure it gets to you in one piece. They generally also have PDF files associated with it that give you instructions. Uh, there's usually four of them for all the different languages, you know, for German, English, Spanish, and French. Um, but choose the ICC profile and drag and drop it into that folder, the profiles folder. Uh, and on a Mac, in that profiles folder, it will ask you to authenticate, which means type in the password for your computer, and then it, you're done. Okay, that's all you need. This program, if you have Canon printer, any Photoshop, Lightroom, any program that uh, view that will reference your profiles folder will reference it from that folder. And that's the, that's the correct one to use now. So, and if you have questions, Email me. This is what I do. I am, you know, I I I want to contribute to everybody's success. I don't want you to be frustrated. Um, this is frustrating. None of this is easy. It is not intuitive, um, and everybody has questions. So, um, and I have not been looking at the chat window. So, uh, there are a few questions in there, and I do want to address them. So, the first one was, what about custom sizes? Good question. So let me put this over here. Okay, so when you're in 
sizes here, you can go down here and manage custom sizes and you can, you know, if you do have a piece of paper that's, um, let's say um, 17 by 30, right? You can do 17 inch. Sorry. Who's that? It's me, sorry. Oh, it's not me, okay. Whew. Okay, 17 by, 17 width by 30 high and click okay. And it's loading the printer information. It's kind of going back to the printer, getting some information. So when you make major changes like that, this might occur and take a couple of minutes when you load your printer for the first time or uh, there, there's firmware updates on the printer. So it's always every occasionally it's going to go back to the printer and kind of, you know, make whatever adjustments it needs to make. But we should now see a custom paper size there. Uh, somebody says, I'm a fan of Canson Edition etching. Um, I am a big fan of Canson Edition etching as well. Uh, but I am also here to tell you that uh, there uh, is are four new papers coming out from Canson Infinity. Um, and I just got shivers because they're really exciting. If you like Canson Edition etching, you're going to love what's coming out. Unfortunately, um, they're not completely out yet. They have made an official announcement. Um, uh, and essentially, uh, and we have some paper and rolls now, we will be getting a new shipment. And I hesitate to say exactly when because of all the problems we've been having getting shipments in from all of our manufacturers, stuff's floating around in the water, you know, in the boats out there in Long Beach Harbor. Uh, but uh, hopefully, cautious your fingers, by the end of April, we're going to have a much larger selection of these papers and rolls. And we're finally getting... Uh, most of them in eight and a half by 11, 10 sheet packs. And these are the papers, you ready? So Canson, when it first came out, specifically had papers made at the Arch Mill in France. Arch, A-R-C-H-E-S, very famous paper mill, uh, making fine art papers for 500 years. Uh, and they, uh, over the years, there were issues between the banishment of Canson and the mill, and then they changed the line. So historically, we had a paper called Arshakarel, which was magnificent. Um, it is being reissued again, but in a, in a pure white version. Okay, so in the past, Arshakarel was a very warm paper. It had no optical brighteners. This new paper, beautiful texture, just like it used to have, uh, that beautiful kind of random watercolor paper texture, but it is now being reissued as a pure white paper. Canson has figured out how to make papers bright white without the use of optical brighteners. And anybody who's taken any of my classes or my talks on uh, inkjet paper, um, you know that optical brighteners is an issue I bring up all the time because they fade over time. A lot of people use papers like Epson Hot Press Bright White or Hanumili Photorag Bright White and optical brighteners just when they're exposed to UV light over time will fade, they will turn yellow. Uh, and if you use museum glass on them, you're negating the optical brighteners because the optical brighteners need UV light to brighten. The whole point of having the optical brighteners in the paper is when they're exposed to UV light, they reflect a bluer light, makes them look whiter. Well, you put museum glass or any sort of UV blocking glazing on it, even the, uh, uh, what they call it, Optima uh, from Chuvu, it makes the print yellow. So it's always been a big problem. So Canson is coming out with Arshak Arel. Um, it's so white, it's almost as white as a bright white paper without the use of optical brighteners. They're also reissuing BFK Reeves in what they call white, which would be the original natural and a pure white, and they're actually called out white and pure white. Um, and I've looked at them and the white is just as white as the old paper and the pure white is a little whiter. Um, again, no optical brighteners. And BFK Reeves is a paper that's really well thought of in the art world. Um, if you're an artist uh, and you're using BFK Reeves, um, you, you'll automatically have credibility. It's a Beautiful paper. It makes your heart flutter when you touch it. It's magnificent. Um, 
uh, and it's got a little bit of texture, not as much as Aquarell. Then the fourth paper is Arch 88. And this is a very, very famous art paper. And it's also um, uh, pure white, uh, very bright, uh, without optical brighteners. Uh, but it's totally smooth. It's really smooth. So the reason why I'm saying is that if you like Canson edition etching, and edition etching is, don't get me wrong, it's a beautiful paper. And up to this point, has had the brightest white point of any 100% cotton paper without the use of optical brighteners. And the whole detail is very nice. It, for, it's, for, 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 it, you know, rag paper really, really, really does bring out details. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. But these new papers, they're going to be game changers. They're really going to be game changers. Now, the advantage that addition etching is going to have is that it, it is actually an economical paper. It costs less than many of the other papers do. But these new papers are, to me, super, super exciting. Because at really the core of everything I do, my conversations are really about paper. All, to me, photography has always been a combination of art and science. The art part to me is your ability to capture an image that you're so proud of that you want to show it, you want to share it, you want to sell it. Uh, and then the other part is how you're going to present it, which to me is paper. The science part is everything we're talking about today. The printer, the drop down menus, what do you choose? How do you choose it? You know, what's the right way to, you know, make decisions on all this stuff? How do you use your camera and everything? So we really have this kind of art and science thing going on. And, um, and the art part is what excites me. The science part allows me to execute my unique artistic signature, which is what to me paper is all about. So it, you know, when it, we get down to it, it doesn't really matter to me whether you have an Epson or a Canon printer. Um, it doesn't really matter what camera you have, as long as we're able to help you create something that matches your vision of what you wanted, um, and it's unique, right? It's, it's not cookie cutter. Uh, every, a lot of people just want to do, they say, well, you know what to do, just tell me what to get. I'm, I can't do that. I can't tell you just what paper to buy. I, I need to get information and understand who you are and what you want and help you get to that point where you're making that decision for yourself. Um, okay, so I skipped one. I have a P900. When feeding velvet fine art through the rear feeder, I'm getting head strikes. I think smudging on the white border areas. So I just, I somehow rather push print in the whole process and I have a print here and you see I've got smudges in the corner, right? I don't know if you can see that. Um, so, and what happened is this paper, as you can see, is not totally flat. It's not totally flat. So even in the rear feeder, the fact that these corners are popping up even that much is affecting the printer and its ability to clear that, right? So again, you know, to correct for it, you do this, you know, turn those corners down a little bit. I just kind of do this, make them go down. Don't, don't break the paper, right? Or if you've got the edge, uh, you know, around the tape, table edge, I put my, my palm, my hand on it, roll it over it, or I use a D-roller. And then when I use a D-roller, it turns the paper down. But this is not solely a printer issue. It's a combination of paper and printer issue. And this is Canton Platine. It's 100% cotton. It's absorbing the environment. And it's going to, those things are going to occur. It's extremely common. So get those corners down. That's, that's how you fix it. Just get them down. Uh, those one one half day, how to choose paper sessions you use to do were very instructive. So yes, I have, um, you know, once we start opening up again and, um, you know, we're able to gather more, we will be doing uh, more things at LACP. Also, for those of you who are local and don't know, um, um, want to make sure that everybody knows that Freestyle is moving our retail store. Uh, we've been in the building we've been in for 50 years, and uh, it's been a great luxury having a 15,000 square foot building. Um, 
the store, the reality is the store has always been a very small portion of our business. And we found a smaller storefront that's going to help us survive whatever the world throws at us because this past year has been challenging to say the least. I'm sure we'll all agree with that. Um, but it's only four blocks away. It's on the other side of Sunset, right across from Opoyo Loco. And um, we're just downsizing the store. And um, mail order is untouched. Uh, we have our still have our 50 or 30,000 square foot facility in Santa Fe Springs. And that um, we've moved all of our office staff down there and we are initiate a phone system where they can telecommute. So we're not having them, anybody who's got a commute doesn't have to go down there every day. And look, we're, we're, we've all gotten really comfortable um, working via Zoom and being able to touch people all over the world. And we're just making things more efficient and ensuring that uh, we just had our uh, 75th, you know, this year is our 75th year in business. And we want to make sure we're in business for another 75 years. So uh, as of, I think, April 19th, we'll be in our new place. So, uh, and we'll be doing more, more workshops through LACP in terms of, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. Okay, so seeing the same images print on different papers uh, and you pointing out the same, okay, so this is the same person. Yep, we'll be doing more of that. Uh, can you pi print Pictorico transparency film in a P800 and what settings would one use? Yes, you can. Um, just use the ultra premium photo paper luster or photo paper glossy. Any glossy media setting will work. That is the appropriate media setting. Um, if you have problems feeding the paper, I tell people to put just a little strip of tape, um, whether it's blue painter's tape or white photo tape at the leading edge of it. So the printer knows where the, the edge is, um, or you could back it with just a white piece of paper. Um, that sometimes will help the, the printer sense uh, the clear media. Transparency can be a little problematic. Uh, I'd like to know about using Pictorico as well. Okay, so I just answered that, that's good. What is Topaz AI Gigapixel? Oh, that's a good question. So. Um, that's the question. That's the program I mentioned earlier. Uh, the company is Topaz. If you type in AI Gigapixel or Gigapixel AI, um, it is a artificial intelligence quote um, method of increasing file size. Uh, you can do dramatic increases um, that are really good. They're not, you know, I'm not going to say they're completely lossless. Um, but it's, to me, it's got a bit of an edge over the other programs that are out there. Uh, it does go on sale quite a bit. Um, I think you could usually pick it up for about $70. I think it fluctuates between $100 down to 70, depending on the time of year and what promotions they're running. Um, you can purchase, you can download a demo to use for seven days. I can tell you that it will take down your computer completely. You will not be able to do anything else on that computer when it's running, it uses a lot of system resources, but the result is really, really nice. So if you're gonna do some major increases, like two, three hundred percent, definitely would recommend checking it out. Uh, and then check it out against the other programs that are out there and what you've been using, whatever you feel comfortable with is what you should be using. Uh, uh, oh, somebody said it's a smart image upsizing tool, okay. Uh, we got that. Um, uh, wouldn't it be nice if the profile list in the printing apps were listed by hierarchy? Yes, it would be. Um, uh, and I've asked for that. And, um, uh, and I think because it's, uh, it, I think it's more of a system issue than it is a program issue. If the OS vendors would get it together. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of times things can't happen because just the way Apple or Windows OS is set up. So um, yeah, I would like it so that you didn't see like all of the um, monitor, <laughs> all of the monitor profiles in there, but you know, and then, you know, another thing just as a side note is on, you know, I, I do teach classes in color management. They're also incorporate. I also have a color management day in my fine art of digital printmaking class. A lot of people will say to me, well, I have an Apple computer and I choose Adobe RGB 1998 as the color space for my monitor. So I must be seeing Adobe RGB 1998. And that's not true. 
your Apple, any modern Apple monitor is P3 as it's, as it's technology, technologically standard color space. It's not an Adobe RGB 1998 monitor and you're not choosing a profile. You're choosing a color space that Photoshop and Lightroom and other programs utilize, um, but you are not magically making a P3 monitor, Adobe RGB 1998 by choosing it, even though it is in the profiles list when you go to your displays um, control panel. So I have a question about interfacing uh, with uh, Lightroom. That is taking images that I'm developing in Lightroom and then bringing them into uh, this uh, Epson program. What, is, there, is there an interface that, that, that can be installed in Lightroom or do I have to do it okay. another way? Okay, so that is an excellent question. So let me show you how to get, so in addition to a standalone application, you can have this image in Photoshop and go to automate and you see Epson print layout here. So if I had multiple images open in Photoshop, they could be opened all in Epson print layout. So you see that it's operating now as a plugin for Photoshop. So if you have an image in Photoshop, you can drag mm -hmm. it in there and uh, you, can, uh, you can open it from there. And okay. does, that, does that work the same way in Lightroom? Uh, it does not. I'm going to show you how to do it in life. Okay. It's a little more common. I was getting there. This is, this is like a movie. It's messed up in the beginning. comes together at the end. <laughs> okay. So now I'm going to go to Lightroom. And where's my Lightroom? Lightroom is over here. So it's a little more, it's not a plugin for Lightroom, although you can do it. So let's see where I'm at here. Okay, so here's a bunch of images that I had in, I took in Silver City, New Mexico. So let's see, I'm going to, I'm going to turn my ratings on. And I'm going to select, let's say these, see how I, I did, I held down the shift key and I selected those. Mm -hmm. So now what I have to do is I've got to go to export. Okay, I'm going to just put them on my desktop um, and they're going to be TIFFs and I'm going to make them, you know, just from a, you know, economical size. So I'm just going to make them seven inches wide on the long end, right? And then I'm going to choose open in other application and then choose Epson print layout. Right, and choose Epson print layout, which it would be in my applications folder, uh, Epson software, Epson print layout, right? And then export. So now you'll see that it is exporting nine files. It's taking its sweet time. There it goes. And it will bring all nine of those files into Epson print layout. And that's how that, that's how it works for Lightroom. Um, so they have to be TIFFs then? Um, well, they don't have to be. I mean, it could be JPEGs. Um, uh, TIFFs are better than JPEGs. Um, they have more information in them. You, you uh, couldn't bring them as raw files. Um, these programs, uh, so I have, um, well, first of all, they're raw in um, Lightroom. Right. And generally when you're bringing files, let's say in the Photoshop, you know, they go into camera raw because Photoshop doesn't really handle raw files. Uh, the typical workflow that we adhere to is when we're working on files, they're raw. Then when we print them, we convert them to a TIFF or a JPEG um, and print that. Raw files are really not necessarily designed to be printed. They're designed as a master file so that you can do all your stuff to them. Uh, so that, that, occur, that, that occurs in, in uh, Lightroom as well. When you print from Lightroom, they're, they, they're converted. They have to be um, rasterized. What? Yes, Lightroom does. When you're printing from Lightroom, a lot of bizarre things happen to files. I really never, ever print from Lightroom. It's horrible. Uh, 
it doesn't <laughs> handle certain things yeah. very well, like color space and size. Yeah. So I never really recommend to anybody to print from Lightroom. And I've done a lot of testing and I don't, you know, let me put it this way at a certain level, I believe photography needs to be fun. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're comfortable just printing out of Lightroom, do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Just do that. that. That's, and you getting the results you want, do that. Mm -hmm. uh, technically speaking, um, I don't do that. I don't use Lightroom as my printing program. It was never really designed as a printing program. It was designed okay. as a raw processing yeah. uh, tool and uh, an easy way to do 90% of what Photoshop does, oh. um, you know, much easier and simple. Um, and it's a great organizational program. It's not really good for printing. So my thing oh, is- yes, and I'm, That's why I'm so excited about this because I hate print printing from Lightroom. Yeah, so here I am. All my images have loaded in there. I've got all nine images there, and I can scroll through them. And obviously, I made them smaller, so they're, you know, just to, for time. But yeah, it, it ex. You, so, but you are exporting them, and uh, in the format that you want. And they're Adobe RGB nineteen ninety eight, and they're tips, and that's that's my standard workflow. So, um, so yeah, we got there. Yeah. Um, okay. What do you think about Profoto RGB versus RGB? for profiles of files going to the printer? So uh, uh, really good question. I cover it in my class. Um, I also have a workshop that I've been doing for nonprofit other, you know, for LACP and other nonprofit photographic organizations It's called, um, that class is called Color Management, Simply Explained and Demystified. Um, and my simple answer is, um, sRGB is our, is our standard RGB color space. It's, let's say this big, okay? And then we have Adobe RGB 1998. It's 35% bigger. And um, our papers um, and our ink are kind of standardized for Adobe RGB 1998. Now, the reality is that paper never is going to fully cover Adobe RGB 1998. But there are a lot of colors out there in that color space that they can print. Um, Pro Photo RGB is like huge. It's massive. Um, and what people really get caught up on, and a lot of this stuff is specs, right? They want the biggest. They want the best. And it really irritates me when I get photographers that say things like, well, I don't consider you a real photographer unless you're working in, in, in a Pro Photo RGB. Well, that actually just proves to me you don't really know what that is because you can't see it. There is no monitor that can see colors beyond Adobe RGB 1998 yet. I've spoken to modern, modern manufacturers. Nobody's really working on a pro photo RGB monitor yet. Um, from a predictability standpoint, Adobe RGB 1998 is our max. Now, if you have colors that are pro photo, they're going outside of our standard color space and then they've got to be dealt with. So let's say you've got a, a paper profile that's this big and you've got a color that's way out here. This choice right here that we haven't talked about yet, perceptual and relative color metric, that tells the print driver how to deal with out of gamut colors in relationship to the paper profile. Okay, so if you have a profile that's this big and you got a color that's out here, it can't ignore it. It has, it can't render it. If your paper profile cannot render that color, it's got to be told what to do with it. So what Perceptual does is it takes the color and it shrinks it. It brings it into gamut. Some people call it crunching it. Crunches it into the color gamut of the paper, okay? Relative color metric will cut it off. It'll figure out what the where the the color is at the edge of the profile, and it'll cut it off. Most people, this is my own statistic, but I, nobody's ever questioned it. I say eighty percent of photographers use perceptual, twenty percent use relative color metric, ninety nine and a half percent of photographers have no idea why they use one or the other. <laughs> no idea. To me, perceptual renders tones more accurately, preserves the tonal range, 
relative color metric you use when you're really trying to nail a color. Like if you've got a target, you know, the company target logo or IBM, you're really trying to nail a color, relative color metric is going to allow you to do that. It also will render brighter colors, colors that are really out of gamut may be brighter, but the choice of which one to use gets down to this, which one looks better? That's the ultimate question. That's the ultimate answer. If you are having problems getting a color with perceptual, switch to relative color metric, but you have to choose black point compensation when using relative color metric. Perceptual incorporates it. So most people choose black point compensation just as a general rule. It doesn't do any harm with perceptual, but it doesn't really do anything with perceptual because again, perceptual is squeezing things into gamut. Relative color metric is cutting them off. So you really wanna have the driver adjust that black point when using relative color metric. So in these two choices- I am a member. Hmm? What was that? Tickets. Oh. Jason Getter, muter. <laughs> so I choose perceptual and black point compensation basically all the time, unless I'm really having a hard time getting the color, then I'll switch to relative, but make sure black point compensation continues to be chosen. So the answer to your question about pro photo RGB and Adobe RGB is I work in Adobe RGB. Um, I know some people work in pro photo. I'm not going to tell them they're wrong. Um, I have some photographers who say, I think, I'm getting more colors out of my prints using ProPhoto RGB. Really, all of this stuff is numbers and math. If the profile can't render it, it can't render it. I mean, you might be seeing something when uh, perceptual and relative color metric are doing, doing in the rendering intent. But to me, ProPhoto is too big for what we're doing right now. It makes them and feel better. It, well, maybe, but also, you know, <laughs> Adobe scares the hell out of you when you change that preference and it says you know you're going from pro photo rgb and you may, may not be able to render all the colors that are in your file you know it's just a bunch of poppycock you know do do what's right for you and there's a lot of you know i get all these people that are like should i update to big sur well if it ain't broke don't fix it don't okay the little red button's there the thing pops up every day telling you to update resist don't do it some of your stuff may not work Right? So it all depends. So these things are all relative. If you have questions, um, by all means, contact me. That's what I'm here for. Um, okay. What about using, okay, so hold on. Uh, what was the name of the smooth, brighter white cans on paper? That, oh, that's from John. Hi, John. Good to see you. Um, Arsh88. What? Go ahead. Um, it's called Arsh88. Um, A-R-C-H-E-S. And the really neat thing about it is that it's a, the, all of these papers are mold made papers, right? Which, made, which means they're made on 500 year old machines um, uh, with a modern manufacturing twist. When I asked them, how are you getting these papers so white without the use of optical brighteners? And they're basically saying, look, it's proprietary. You know, we've, we have a purification process. We've done certain things to make these papers bright white. They also all have brand new coatings. Canson owns the coatings. They own the manufacturing process of these papers. It's all really new. The neat thing about the RC88 is that it's, it's got that luxurious kind of 100% cotton paper feel on the back with a very smooth top coat. I mean, it's really very smooth. Um, Excuse me, could you, spell, could you spell that again? I, I missed it. What, Arsh? A-R-C-H-E-S. Yeah, Say that again. A-R-C-H-E-S. Thank you. It's like Arches. So there are, all the products are listed on our website, um, but the sheets are just not available yet. We, we just got some rolls in a few weeks ago. We're, the next shipment's going to have mostly rolls, but it will have some eight and a half by 11, 10 sheet packs so people can start trying it. And I could start making sample prints for people. So it's kind of this rollout is like an iPhone. They announce the phone and then, it, you know, you can't get it for three months. It's, it's like peeling off a band aid really, really, really slow. So, <laughs> but I just do this and I go, COVID, 
Okay, we got some other interesting questions here. Um, so uh, ultra premium lesser option not appearing in printer settings, media type on print layout menu, printer is P600. Ultra premium photo paper luster is just like ultra premium luster. Now, if you're not seeing a full range of media settings um, on the print driver on your printer, um, check to make sure that the correct driver is loading. So if you go into your system preferences screen here, and you go into printers and scanners, and this is very common. And again, this is an Apple issue more than anything else. And it happens on both Epson and Canon printers. So I'm on the P900, right? And see where it says Epson SC P900 series? If it says dash air print, delete it and re-add it and make sure you do not add the air print driver. Okay, the air print driver is a scale down, reduced functionality driver that Apple loads automatically because they want you to be able to print from your iPhone or your iPad. It is not the full driver. Okay, so you would delete the, well, I'm gonna, let's just say I'm gonna add this again. So don't go down here and add that, right? Go to add printer or scanner and then click on your printer. And then over here, I've the way I've got mine set up, I'm going, I'm on a network, but it could have, let's say, actually, let's go here, Bonsure. See what goes on there. Um, okay, so see where it says secure air print or air print? Do not ever load those drivers. Always go to the name of the driver. This is one of the big things that people call me up about. And, and it's every time. Do not allow it to load that air print driver. Okay, um, Capture One versus Epson Print uh, with print layout. Um, you know what? Um, I don't have Capture One. I'm not an expert in Capture One. Um, I don't know if Capture One has an option to use an external program. You're gonna have to look at that. Um, uh, one of these days I will turn the battleship around and you know, do some playing around with Capture One. I do know people love it um, versus uh, Lightroom, but I'm not an expert in there and I don't know. Uh, but obviously what you could do is export your files uh, to the format and size that you want and use Epson Print Layout as a standalone application. So you always have that option. And really between Epson Print Layout and the, uh, the equivalent Canon program, I use them as standalone applications mostly now. I just find it a lot more convenient for me. Uh, how do you print from InDesign? Um, uh, export your file as a JPEG or a PDF file and bring it into Photoshop um, or just uh, and, and rasterize the PDF file um, and print from there. Uh, InDesign is uh, designed to be printed postscript uh, for the printing industry. So to print on these types of programs, they need to be JPEGs um, or TIFF files, so and you have the ability to export as a JPEG. Um, the neat thing about programs like this is that, uh, and the one that Canon has, is that I do have customers who are schools that are in printing department, uh, the uh, the design department, and they're using InDesign and Illustrator, and they just export their file in the message that they, in the format that they want, and they drag and drop it right into Epson Print Layout or Canon Professional Print and Layout. So. Um, so it okay. can print a PDF. Hmm? So it can print a PDF. Um, the not directly. You've got to open it in Photoshop. When you open up a PDF in Photoshop, it asks you if you want to rasterize it, and you do. And then from within Photoshop, you can send it to Epson Print Layout. Okay. But our standard file format for printing on all of these printers are TIFFs and JPEGs. Okay. Um, somebody sent me a screenshot of something, Michael. What is this? The new location. What? The new location. The new location. Of the store. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, 50, uh, 5401 Sunset Boulevard. It's literally four blocks west. It's uh, There's an Opoyo Loco and a Jiffy Lube. It's right across the street from that. It's right across from Next to it's house. closer to Western. So. Um, Okay, so there's a thank you for all the great info. That's nice. Uh, may the print be with you. That's cool. 
Uh, Janice here, a couple of announcements to make at the end of your class. Nope, forget it. Uh, no, it's okay. Uh, it's 11.52, so we're getting there. Uh, somebody has lift, listed the new Canson papers. Thank you, Michael. So the BFK Reeves is gonna be two ways, white and pure white. So the pure white is a little whiter than the white. Um, and they're all matte. Uh, they're also uh, going to be um, coming out with a fifth paper called uh, Barita Photography 2 Matte. So it's going to be the, not really the first matte Barita paper on the market. There was one about mm, 15 years ago. Um, they're bringing back that type of product. It's pretty interesting. So, uh, you know, when we get that in, we'll have samples of that as well. And, um, and thank you, John, for saying it's an informative presentation. So, okay, so, um, so yeah, that's, that's Epson print layout and probably a lot of questions you didn't thought you were gonna get the answers to. Uh, 